now I've got hail. Wow. <laughs> You're being mean. Mean the merciless. Uh, Hot hail. Mm. We might die. We might. We get crushed these by are, These are the last words <laughs> of uh, Jason Buck and Rick recording this. Please, okay. please send help. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Law and Legend with your host Rick Scott, bringing you legendary tales inspired by the rich traditions of world folklore and mythology. This episode of Law and Legend comes to you thanks to the contributions of our Patreon subscribers, story folk Christy Carson and Paul Jackson. We thank them for their generosity and their enthusiasm for our stories. And if you like what you hear and you'd like to hear more, please consider joining Christy and Paul in supporting the podcast by becoming a patron. For more details, visit our website and click support us. Our guest on the show today is storyteller Jason Buck. Jason has been a performer for most of his adult life, including cabaret and comedy, but his passion lies in storytelling. Drawing on traditional favourites and introducing new ideas, Jason's stories are told in the oldest and the best ways, as live storytelling performances for modern audiences. And he has performed across the UK and mainland Europe, blending traditional and contemporary motifs, vocal sound effects and pure unadulted fantasy. Jason has won silver at the grand annual Lying Festival, Best Bard, at the Theatre of Joy and Sorrow at Profound Decisions, and written and published four collections of his own stories. He's performed all over the UK, from Southampton to Sky, to, from Southampton to Sky, and appeared at Sting in the Tale Festival and Romsey Storytelling. Jason tells stories to adults and also young people and children, delivers training in storytelling and communication skills, and writes and illustrates his own books. The best way to reach him or see what he's up to is through his Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Jason Book Storyteller. Or you can check out his website at www.jasonbookstoryteller.co.uk. Jason specializes in dark fairy tales that blend dark magic and uplifting love themes. So without any more fanfare, Let's hear Jason's story for us today. We are by the side of a large pool, nestled between steep-sided granite mountains, grey, rugged and sparsely covered with heather and rough grass. The water is dark with peat, ice cold and said to be bottomless. The shoreline is made of scattered grey rocks pebbles and boulders that have tumbled from the mountain sides. A young woman kneels on the shore right next to the water's edge. Her name is Catriona. She is beautiful, with copper-red hair, milk-white skin and eyes of green fairy fire. But those eyes are rimmed with red as she is crying, sobbing. Less than an hour ago, She watched the man she loved drown. Earlier that afternoon, Ty had asked Catriona if she'd like to go for a walk. He'd been unusually nervous and wouldn't say why he'd particularly wanted to go for a walk on that day, but the two of them had been inseparable since infancy and she'd happily agreed. To anyone else it was clear that they loved each other and were destined for a future life together. This was clear to all, especially to Briek, who also loved Catriona and would happily see Tyg out of the way, not that either of the young lovers knew this. That morning, Tyg had arrived at Catriona's house, dressed in the full eight yards of cloth that made up his family's tartan, pinned at the shoulder of a smart new linen shirt with a brooch that was an heirloom that had belonged to his father and his father's fathers for many generations before. He was a young man, tall enough to be handsome without being intimidating, good-looking enough to be attractive without overshadowing Catriona's looks, and his family owned a good-sized plot of crofting land. 
He took his young lover by the hand and they walked over the hills and tussocky grazing land towards a lonely pool. They both knew of its existence, but old stories about its unplumbable depths and the fae that haunted that area kept most people away. Tige prattled aimlessly as they walked. Occasionally his hand would stray to his sleeve where, unseen by Catriona, he would fuss with a small and delicate item hidden there. As they reached the basin and the mountains where the pool lay, the great cliffs frowning over its smooth obsidian surface, Tig gave a shout and pointed. Champing the grass, not far from the water, was a beautiful white horse. Its skin was as white as starlight, and its mane as white and as light as gossamer, and its eyes as dark and bottomless as mountain pools. Bearing no tack, harness or brand, the horse, as the young man said, must be wild and not currently owned by anyone. I will capture it and make it a present for you. A special present, he finished with a wink and a shy smile. Catriona was both confused and flattered, but protested that he shouldn't be so stupid or do such a dangerous thing. But the young man, being a young man, with his young lady watching, didn't heed any words of warning and was resolved to prove his worth. He stepped slowly up to the horse, its white height shining, its gossamer mane drifting in the air, its flanks rippled with powerful muscles. Holding out his hand, he approached the animal from the front. It nuzzled his upturned palm with its velvet nose, and he moved closer to stroke its neck and whisper quiet words of comfort and reassurance. Catriona held her breath. Tig seemed to be charming the horse as it stood placidly, allowing him to move down its flanks and lean against its side. He turned, grinning at Catriona, before easing himself onto the animal's back and sitting proudly like a Celtic chieftain of old. Catriona, the young man called out, I claim this beast in your name and offer it to you as a gift. My gift for... His next words, for our wedding day, if you'll have me, were cut off as suddenly the horse reared and bolted. Now, when a horse bolts, you hold on. To try and get off can mean great injury, especially hitting granite-strewn ground from the back of a fast-moving mount, and Tig knew this. He gripped the animal's sides with his knees, clutched handfuls of its mane and bent low to its back, trying to steer it in a circle to bring it under control. But this was no ordinary horse. With a fierce and supernatural strength and will, it sped straight towards the pool, leaping into the shallows and plunging into the depths, down, down into the brown water. Tig was dragged down, down with the beast, until there was nothing left but bubbles on the surface. The young man had been dragged into the depths and to his doom by a water horse, by a kelpie. After Catriona had sat and wept until she could weep no more, she stood, looked at the glassy smooth surface of the pool one last time and turned and walked away. She had no plan as to where she was walking, but simply walked, heading further into the mountains, numb with shock. She walked and walked, her arms hanging limply by her sides and her eyes blank and pitiful, until she came to a mountain stream. Instead of being a tumbling, roiling ribbon of crystal clear water, this stream ran red with blood, and the sight of this brought the young woman out of her despondent reverie with a jolt. Looking upstream, she could see a figure, crouching at the stream's edge, industriously working away, and the blood was flowing from where this figure was. Cautiously approaching, it became clear that the figure was dressed in green and was washing blood-stained clothes in the cold mountain water. This must be the Kyuntiach, a fay known by many names and a portent of death and found in lonely places such as this, washing the bloody clothes of those who are about to die. 
Catriona felt sure the clothes the Kuntiach was washing belonged to Taig, whose beautiful manly body was even now being torn apart and consumed by the Kelpie after it had drowned him in the depths of the mountain pool. And she walked in a trance to where the bent figure was hard at work. She reached the Kuntiach without her notice, and peering over the hag's shoulders she could see the gore-sodden clothing, a night-blue coat with bright brass buttons, as she plunged it into the water of the stream again and again before slapping it onto a flat rock and scrubbing, leaving scarlet trails that drifted and twisted and span together in the once clear stream. These are not the clothes of my precious man, said the young woman flatly, as she looked at the unfamiliar garment. The Kyontiach started, turning to face Catriona. She was hideous, with great, aged, sagging flaps of skin hanging in folds like curtains of flesh from her sunken jowls and scrawny throat. Her eyes were pinpoints of silver-grey mica glittering angrily from yellowed, oyster-rimmed sockets, and her hair hung in thin, greasy-grey rat-tails on her shoulders. Her gnarled and lumpen hands protectively clutched the green gown she wore about her, but not close enough to cover her great, webbed feet. "'Of course they're not, foolish child!' screeched the Kuntiach, revealing her single remaining tooth, crooked and brown like bogwood in her puckered hole of a mouth. "'These are the clothes of a man yet today, whereas your foolish goat of a boy is neither dead nor is he soon to be!' Catriona rocked, shaken to her core. She had seen Tig carried into the pool under its waters, and he had not appeared again. "'Not dead!' she cried. Then he is alive? Yes, yes, he's very much alive and sitting on his own in a air-filled cave beneath the mountain pool, replied the Kuntiach in her pinched and cracked voice. But before you ask me anything else, know that I will answer you three things and no more. And you've just had one, so you've only got two left. Choose carefully before you go mathering and blathering and clucking out foolish things, for I'll no hear your complaints after. The young woman stopped, thought for a moment, then asked, If my tig is not dead, how do I rescue him? <laughs> That'll do, Hen, chuckled the Kuntiach, pleased the young woman had chosen her question well. Do you know the great boulder that is known as the long man's anvil? Catriona nodded. Do you know why it's called the long man's anvil? Catriona shook her head. "'because beneath that great stone is a vast cave, "'and in that cave is a blacksmith. "'But this is no ordinary blacksmith. "'Not that any blacksmith is ordinary, "'but this smith is a giant. "'They say the stone was put there by the devil or, or St. Michael "'or one of his lot, well, I don't know. "'He was put there as a punishment, and he's trapped there, "'and when he rings his great hammer on the anvil in his cave, "'it sounds like thunder in the mountain tops. You must go to the giant and ask him to make you a bridle of metal links of cold iron to trap a fairy horse. Then cover the bridle in blood to hide the smell of cold iron and to tempt the kelpie that took your man to come to you. Go to meet it near its pool and climb on its back. As it did with your damn fool of a boy, it will rush into the deep water and drag you down. Let it. When you are under the water, pull the bridle onto its head. If you do it above the water, it'll throw you or change form or change into a man or something and escape. But once the bridle is on, command it to take you to your man before your breath runs out and don't let go of beast nor bridle until you're both back on dry land. Thank you cried Catriona, her heart bursting with hope, and she turned to run to find the great stone. "'Do you know what your last question?' asked the Kuntiach, with a twinkle in her sprightly eyes. Catriona paused, and then, "'Yes. Why didn't the Kelpie kill and eat my tig?' <laughs> "'The Kuntiach gave a gummy grin. She'd been hoping Catriona would ask this. "'Today?' 
Tig was going to ask you to marry him. And he confided this to one he thought a friend. But that wee man has also set his cap at you and tricked Tig into believing a great gift was needed to win your hand. The gift of a white horse. And he knew just where to find a wild one to capture and call your own. Now, chose not to be haunted by a vengeful ghost. This man made a deal with the Kelpie not to kill but to take young Tige and hide him in an underwater cave, promising him fresh meat in the future with Tiger's security. This other man's name is Breach. <gasps> Aye, continued the Kuntiach at Catriona's gasp. The same Breach has been a friend to you both since you were young. And the Kintiach's cackling bounced from wall to wall of the unforgiving mountains as Catriona turned, sobbing, and fled in the direction of the great stone known as the Long Man's Anvil. At the foot of a mist-topped and snow-capped mountain lay an enormous boulder. Big as a laird's hall, it sat, silent and immovable, resting in a hollow of some sort. How was Catriona to find any way to lift it to get underneath? There must be a hidden way in. Five full minutes of searching brought only the discovery of a ragged and rangy hawthorn tree. The poor thing seemed to be squeezing out from under the rock, its reaching roots like grasping fingers curling over the unyielding granite surface. But on closer inspection, and peering between the crawling limbs, she realised she could see down, deep, into the earth. The roots spanned a tunnel leading directly down and under the great boulder. Scraping her body as she wriggled down into the tangle of roots, Catriona found the network of rope-like tendrils quickly opened up, allowing her to climb deeper and deeper, like clambering over rough and fibrous rigging. Twenty feet, forty feet, sixty feet and more she climbed down until the network thinned out to only a few roots hanging together and twisting around each other and making a very convenient ladder of sorts. This ladder brought her down through a hole in the ceiling and on to the floor of a huge cave. In the middle was an anvil as large as a cow. A red infernal glow lit the space from a titanic forge, casting long and gently flickering deep shadows that obscured the identity of the objects and equipment arrayed around the room's edge. The air was stiflingly hot and rank with the reek of old sweat. She picked her way carefully towards the great anvil, and in answer to her timid, Hello, 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 hello. A bulky mass moved in the shadows. First it was round and impossible to determine what it belonged to, but rapidly unfurled. With the red-hot coals behind it making its outline shimmer in the heat, the shape resolved into that of a man, but a man many, many times larger than any Catriona had met. She thought the giant would never stop, but eventually he stood at his full height, twice that of a barn door, sweat glistening on his brawny arms, his hair and beard were long and shaggy like uncarded fleece, his eyes, reflecting the forge light, seemed to glow with a demonic intensity. But the thing that caught her attention was a thick collar of bright silver around its throat. Why has a little mortal girl foolishly strayed into my smithy? boomed the giant in a deep and sonorous voice, sounding like boulders being dropped into the ocean. He loomed over her. This close she could see his pale skin, grimed with dirt and soot. The smell of his unclean body in this sweltering room was almost overpowering, and she realised that if she wanted to escape, she would never be able to climb the ladder of roots to safety before the giant simply plucked her off and bit her in half. Catriona was terrified, but she'd come here to do a job, and, best as she could, she summoned up her courage, firmly planted her feet, stuck out her chin, and made her demand. I need you to make a bridle of cold iron to catch a kelpie. <laughs> The giant chuckled, not unkindly, in reply, 
but also rubbed his finger along the inside of the heavy silver collar he wore. It looked sore. Why do you wear that collar? she asked. Not out of choice, replied the giant. No, centuries ago before you tiny people came to my isles, I smithed a sword for a demon to use in a war against the angels. The angels won. And to punish me, an angelic smith made this collar of silver which has held about my throat ever since. I cannot file nor strike it off, but every time I do a good deed in the eyes of the angels, the collar gets looser. One day I will have done my penance and will be able to slip it over my head. Until then, for my sins, it does not allow me to leave my forge or it chokes me. Well, you could do a good deed and help me to rescue my man, said Catriona, feeling bolder now. You must always give something in exchange for a smith's work. And what will you give me? asked the giant, folding his broad arms across his chest. Catriona hadn't thought this far. I... Uh, I have no money with me. No jewellery, no valuables of any kind. I have nothing to give, she started. The giant reached out his hand as big as a hogshead barrel, and with as much gentleness as he could manage, ran Catriona's hair over his fingers before straightening up, taking a breath, a look of consideration on his face. If you will willingly give me twelve hairs from your fiery head, I will make you your bridle of cold iron, he said. Of course, replied Catriona, wondering. But what for? I will beat them and meld them with gold and draw them into wire and wind them into harp strings for the angels and maybe they will forgive me a little more. So Catriona plucked twelve of the longest hairs from her head and gave them to the giant. Then she sat in a corner, away from the forge as the huge smith pumped bellows the size of ox carts, making the coals blaze furiously before smelting and hammering until he had made a bridle of iron, plunging it into a barrel of water with a hiss to cool and temper it. When he handed it to Catriona, she asked that he lay his knife on top of the anvil. To her, it was as long as a sword. With the point, she pricked her palms, running the cold iron bridle through her hands to smother it in her blood, before climbing up and out of the cave, back to the world above. The young woman approached the dark pool quietly, cautiously looking from side to side until she saw the Kelpie, innocent and beautiful looking in its horse form, grazing peacefully near the water's edge, its hide as white as starlight, its hair as fine and white as gossamer, and its eyes as black and bottomless as a mountain pool. She backtracked and circled round until she was approaching the animal from upwind, hoping the scent of her blood would both disguise the cold iron bridle in her clothing and tempt the monster. It worked. The beast's nostrils flared, catching the ferrous smell, and it lifted its head and looked in her direction. She smiled sweetly and walked towards it. In return, the Kelpie calmly walked in her direction and allowed Catriona to stroke its head subtly licking at her palms as it did. Walking slowly down its side, she reached a point where she could jump and then hoist herself onto its back. As before, with Tige, as soon as she was astride the Kelpie, it bolted and headed for the water, kicking up wild fountains of spray with its hooves, and then, with Catriona clinging desperately to its back, it plunged into the depths. Fighting the urge to gasp as she hit the freezing water, she was dragged down, down, down. Silvery bubbles tickled past her face, and the increasing water pressure squeezed the air in her lungs and made her ears ache. Now, desperately and both as quickly and carefully as she could, she pulled the cold iron bridle that the giant had forged for her from inside her clothing. The Kelpie sensed it instantly, and she felt it panic. 
but before it could change form or rise to the surface or do anything else, she deftly slipped it over its muzzle and pulled it tight against its cheeks, the bit sliding into its mouth as it fought against the burning, binding iron. "'Take me to my man before my breath runs out!' screamed Catriona, and though to her ears all she could hear was a bubbling, bubbling, gargling cacophony, the beast seemed to understand. At the point where lights began to burst in front of her eyes and she felt sure her body would betray her and make her gasp in lungfuls of brown water, the Kelpie breached the surface inside a small cave, and she had never been so pleased to feel cold air rush into her breath-starved body. The cave was lit with a low glow from phosphorescent mushrooms that studded the walls, and in the dim light she saw Tig standing up in alarm, staring in amazement and admiration as Catriona, still astride the bone-white fairy horse, shook the water from her beautiful red hair and smiled at him. Short minutes later, Tig was wringing the water from his kilt on the shore, watching as Catriona stripped the cold iron bridle from the Kelpie's head. It revealed a nasty red burn scar where it had criss-crossed the beast's face, and no sooner was it free of the bridle than it dove into the depths until again there were only bubbles left on the surface. Catriona and Tig held each other and wept wept with relief at the end of their adventure, wept as they rejoiced at Tig's return to safety and for their reunion. "'I think you hadn't finished what you were saying when you got stolen away,' said Catriona, smiling up into Tig's eyes. Feeling a fear almost as great as that of being kidnapped by a man-eating water monster, Tig chewed his lip, feeling in his sleeve for the object he had concealed there. "'Catriona!' I have always loved you, and if you'll have me, I would like you to be my wife and for me to be your husband, he said, holding out a beautiful filigree necklace of silver and moonstones that had been his original wedding gift to her. I will, she cried, holding up her hair so that he could put the necklace on her. I will, and I would fight a thousand Kelpies to be your wife. And so, together they went back to their village, cold, wet, tired, but very much in love. Yes, Tig confronted Briach about his deception, but where was the proof? Stories of Kelpies and mountain hags and imprisoned giants were met with scorn and disbelieving smiles. In the end, fists were flung and noses were bloodied, but little else was done and everyone moved on with their lives. One day, not too long after this, Tig and Catriona were married. They exchanged their vows in front of their families and their friends and the rest of the village, and a feast was held in their honour. And as the night fell, and the guests settled into their cups and danced and laughed and drank, no one noticed the arrival of a stranger, dressed in clothes as white as starlight, with hair as white and fine as gossamer, eyes as black and bottomless as a mountain pool, with burning criss-cross scars across his face, and what looked like water weeds trailing behind him. Nor did anyone notice him approach Briech, who was dressed in a smart, new, night-blue coat with bright brass buttons. Certainly no one saw what happened next, as Briech's debt was settled, nor, for that matter, did anyone ever see Briech again. But for Catriona and Tig, they both lived full and loving married lives and had many children and grandchildren, and they both lived happily ever after. I met Jason a few months ago, before a performance of his show Dark Norse, here in the city of Sheffield. And sitting underneath the evening sky in a covered conservatory, suddenly the clouds opened and we soon found ourselves competing against the elements. There was rain, there was lightning, there was thunder and even hail. Luckily we managed to finish the interview before things got really impossible. But there will be some ambient background weather in this interview. 
Jason calls himself a lover of dark fairy tales, so I asked him to tell us more about the Jason Buck storytelling brand. It's, it tends to be the dark stuff. I like the dark fairy tales. I like the, I like the gothic. I like the, uh, um, uh, the dangerous and the exciting. Um, there's a, a lovely storyteller who uh, I used to see at the, um, at the Winchester Story, Story Club, a woman called Janet, who goes under the, the name of uh, Bluebird, the storyteller. And we both ended up by, by swapping and, and, and throwing contacts to each other as somebody sort of contacted me and says, well, I've got a children's birthday to do and I'm looking for this, this, this. And says, ah, okay, let me recommend Bluebird. And someone else saying, well, yes, I'm looking for something quite gory and exciting. For, okay, that could be Jason, my friend Jason, who, who does that. So the, the, the tour that I'm doing at the moment, the show I'm doing at the moment, is called Dark Norse. And while I've told Viking stories before, uh, and they all tend to be kind of very jolly tales about Thor being hilariously stupid and strong and Loki being mischievous but, but ultimately punished and Thor being magnificent and Freya and all the others kind of the traditional gods doing the traditional things. The, the, the show that I'm doing at the moment um, is, uh, there's three stories. One is a traditional story about Odin and how he lost his eye and how he gave that for wisdom. Uh, and when you're describing somebody pressing their fingertips behind their eyelids into the socket, ready to gouge out their own eye. Then you can see the audience starting to cringe and hide their faces. And I have to remind them, it said Dark Norse on the label. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's nasty. But the thing is that it is horrible. You know, how do you get around the fact, oh, and Odin popped his eye out and got free wisdom. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's an amazing thing for someone to do to, get, to gain the power. And then he goes on to, when he wants to discover the runes, to hang himself from Yggdrasil, the, uh, the world tree, and impale himself with a spear and hang there for nine days and nine nights. So these are incredible things that are there, but they're often, quite often glossed over as being a bit yucky. Mm. And I think especially if you've got younger audiences, and it, and it is unsuitable for them. But then I go on to do two other tales, which are, it's a 14 plus show. Mm. So yeah, they're, they're very dark. There's some black magic in, in one of them. And there's, you know, there's uh, uh, potential relations between the shield maiden of the last story and uh, the uh, the Viking nobleman. Uh, I mean, it's not going to too much graphic detail, but it's stuff that, you know, that actually, oddly enough, the kids would be fine with, but the parents would often be uncomfortable with their children hearing. Mm. And, I can, <laughs> and I can see the parents in the audience sometimes flicking their eyes between their child and me and their child and me and their child and me uh, was the child's just listening, wrapped. So dark stuff, very long answer to it. So the darker stuff, the more gothic, the dark fairy tales, the dark woods and the, and the kind of the, uh, the strange things that creep around in the shadows. Mm. But there's also love, actually. Sorry, not love, actually. That's a film that exists, isn't it? Love, comma, actually. In that there's a lot of love that goes through the stuff that I write as well. It's about romance and it's all those things about, you know, good like overcoming impossible odds um, and lovers being reunited or love struggling, you know, uh, to succeed above and beyond um, the darkness. So the darkness is there as the threat. That's the, that's the interesting, exciting, sparkling darkness. And then at the end, love should win or the baddie gets punished. <laughs> Traditional stock stuff. So, uh, dark but not nihilistic. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants a story that ends up with, and everybody died. Or at least, not every story, and everybody died. Yeah, you want sort of resolution. There's a thing about hope, I think, in storytelling. There's a thing that, I mean, there's lots of academic sort of studies, you know, and about how we use it and how we use it for, you know, for transmission of communication and for, you know, for cultural references. But, you know, I think at its core level, they're entertaining and they take us places and the fact that it is such an interesting medium of sitting and listening you're not watching the moving pictures on a screen so the pictures are in your head you become immersed and introspective and so you want to be taken through the danger and the excitement and the thrill but you want the resolution at the end everything has to come right somehow unless it's a tragedy of course then that's different <laughs> and you can enjoy the tragedy there and think how wonderful my life is not like that tragedy <laughs> When I asked Jason what attracted him to storytelling, he told me that at the centre of it, for him, was the experience of sharing stories with his audiences. Every, every show is different. Every time I tell a story is different. Every story is you know, different. So there's lots of, lots of different things that kind of happen or different things that I can feel. But yeah, the, the show that I'm doing at the moment, the Dark Norse show, even though it's dark and it's nasty and there's some really gruesome bits in it, um, Feeling, feeling the audience sort of being so quiet because they're so intent on wanting to 
really listen to the detail and be enchanted by some of the things that happen and um, re immerse themselves into you know, the real sort of visibility of, of what the characters are seeing or what's going on around the characters. I'm, I'm, I'm quite often quite physical in my storytelling. Um, uh, and there's some great characters of trolls and ice giants that are actually made of ice and uh, uh, an undead Viking king, Draur, and being those things and being those people and uh, uh, is, is, is lovely to do. And watching people really immersed, just absolutely concentrating on things and then hearing, you know, lots of nice, nice feedback at the end that yeah they weren't actually bored they were actually listening and listening and really really intent uh, and when you can feel that from the audience you know that kind of the story's right and the telling's going well and everybody you and, and the people there are in the same the same sort of mental and emotional space together it's uh, immediate feedback and like you say a relationship with your audience yeah, yeah. Made a, um, when i was a kid i wanted to be a writer and I didn't really do a lot. Uh, it wasn't something that um, developed in my life. But when I discovered storytelling, it really yeah. is that yes. that performance yeah. experience, isn't it? That kind of like uh, shared experience. Absolutely, yeah. I asked Jason to share with us the moment he decided he was going to be a storyteller. So I think probably something that actually was uh, a great influence was a friend of mine inviting me to the Beyond the Border Storytelling Festival in Wales around about 1996 and back then you could volunteer and you'd get a cheap ticket and I'd just finished studying we went along and I stood for three hours in the baking sunshine in, the, in a car park directing people but then went and saw people like uh, Hugh Lupton and Nick Hennessy and Toop and uh, Ben Haggerty and, and, and uh, um, lots of other people um, whose names escape because lots of yeah, lots of great storytellers um, and uh, I, I sort of I went there it was at the time it was on every year and then it went to every two years but after a succession of like three or four visits there I, I had come to a conclusion one morning when I wasn't driving so the next morning as we as we left the campsite on the last day and I think I was probably back back into a, a, a plastic cup full of something weird from the beer tent as we drove away from the site I announced to my friends that I was going to buy a harp and become a bard <laughs> and then people pointed out how much harps cost and then a friend of mine who's a bit taller than me so I'm six foot four he's six foot six and and built like a frost giant um he said oh I've got this uh, antique mandolin that my parents bought me of course um but the neck on it is so narrow my fingers are too wide I can't actually physically play it would you like that to borrow that instead of that? So I borrowed that and started looking into storytelling. So I was kind of very inspired by that magical experience of Beyond the Border. Uh, I haven't been for a number of years, unfortunately, now for, for various reasons. But um, that walking through the fairy lights across the across the cliff top down into the, the castle grounds and seeing all the people there and the magic of the, the marquees and everything else that was kind of going on there that make that festival. Uh, very inspiring. Absolutely lovely place. Absolutely lovely kind of weekend to be able to properly allow myself to kind of immerse into that so I think that's probably my, one of my favourite memories as it were of storytelling yeah it's, uh, it's funny what you were saying about uh, uh, announcing to your friends that you're going to be a bard because um, I had a very similar experience I think yeah. you, you start going to these things and um, you're, you know, you're enjoying them you think it's great and then you maybe wonder about oh, maybe I could do a bit of that but then you yeah. just see somebody who really makes you think now I've got to do this yes and for me, that was uh, Cat Quartermass. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, show yeah. Yeah. At the Story Forge. Uh, and I was just blown away by it. And yeah. I remember walking home uh, at night in Sheffield underneath the stars. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thinking, that's what you want. Yeah. I'm going to be a storyteller. I've got to do a storyteller. I've uh, got to do storytelling yeah. um, in some capacity, which, you know, as I've explained, yeah. you know, the. The podcast is very much a solution to the problem of having <laughs> too many uh, dreams and creative pursuits, perhaps. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. But it's so about the pursuit of happiness. It's not about the goals. It's the pursuit of happiness. So if those mm. things are making you happy and you can enjoy doing those things. Oh, that's it. Yes, Kat, Kat Quatermass is somebody. She and I once um, uh, uh, ended up um, crossing rubber swords in the field back in the, uh, back in the late 90s. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Kat Weatherall is the other person I meant to say. As soon as you said Kat, Kat Weatherall... Uh, was also one of the kind of early storytellers I saw early on in my experience of storytelling who her and her, um, her, her comedy without being slapstick uh, her humour and I think also her 
her sexuality in it as well. So some of the stuff, I went to a couple of late night ones that she did, which were very wooed, uh, but brilliantly so, and brilliantly <laughs> funny. And then that was obviously toned down depending on other audiences stuff. But there was, mm. that was a nice, it was a diff, you know, very different style from some of the other people I'd seen. Were there any storytellers, I asked, which inspired him? or whom he considered to be his role models? I think out of those, out of those, the two people would probably be Cat Weatherall and, and Nick Hennessy. Cat Weatherall, because I think of her, her energy, her use of comedy in something that's very dramatic, uh, the, the, the sexuality she, 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 she puts into things without it being rude or mucky. Um, and I liked Nick Hennessy because of his, uh, especially sort of back in, the, back in the 90s, his kilted, bearded, open lid, open-necked, linen-shirted, heart-playing, kind of uh, blacksmith that he, he came across was a, to- was a total bardic hero. He looked exactly as you imagine, you know, uh, you'd want to be. And then told some great stories and sang some great songs. So between those two, one, one felt like a very sort of, uh, Nick Hennessy stuff feels like he's a, he's a craftsman who has really researched and polished and, pre- and now is presenting kind of old law, you know, in, in for a modern audience and, and, and executing it very well. And having had the odd conversation with him over the years, he seems like a very nice chap. Um, and Cat Weatherall just sort of brings a, a, a wonderful human uh, female energy to it uh, that kind of frees it, for, it feels like it frees, frees it from the, uh, the constraints of canon. And you know, she's bringing a sort of, a, uh, even if some of them are old stories or her stories, there's a newness and there is a, uh, an irreverence to it, which is enjoyable. When I met Jason, he had a thriving tour of performances on the go with an impressive online following and shows that were regularly selling out. So I wasn't actually quick enough to pick up a ticket for the show that evening. Even in the midst of the recent lockdown, Jason adapted quickly, moving his performances online and beaming directly into people's living rooms via Zoom to deliver varied sets of Norse, Egyptian and Greek tales, as well as the story of the Staffordshire clay dragon, which I had the pleasure of watching with my own housemates. I asked Jason how he made the transition from story enthusiast to a successful professional storyteller. I think it kind of grew. I started by going to storytelling clubs and um, just experimenting with with new stories. I I tend to tell stories, a lot of the stories I tell are my own original stories. Yes, there's there's, there's some um, uh, traditional stuff and I'm going to be doing, in in May, I'm going to be doing uh, some Egyptian stories, which are the traditional uh, 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 stories there but so I was writing my stuff writing my own stuff and then taking it along to clubs in uh, Southampton and Winchester and down in Ringwood which is in the, the New Forest and uh, uh, doing those uh, doing those stories there and then it was just a matter of, I think of just kind of doing more and more I felt that I suddenly had a, a collection of stories enough to be able to do two hours worth of telling on my own mm. so I thought well why don't I just put them all together and I'll ask this nice place if they could you know what would it be like if I wanted to put on a a, you know, a, an evening show here. Um, it, this is the place in Southampton, the Art House uh, a Community Arts Cafe in Southampton, and um, they were very hospitable and said absolutely yes. And we worked together, and I, and I, I cautiously put out a Facebook event and invited people, and it sold out. So I, I asked if I could have another night, the next night, and I did, and it sold out. Now I don't always sell out all my shows, but that was really, I think, it gave me a lot of confidence to think, oh, actually, people want to come along and. What I'm doing here might, might be interesting. At least the way I'm telling people about it is uh, is interesting. So I just did that, and then I was uh, then I was writing new collections of stories, or I deli- uh, put together uh, a specific collection around a particular theme, um, and then put on another show. But it'd be sort of one show every sort of th- uh, every three months or so. So I put on one or two nights, and then that just grew to new places and extra places until um, early last year was when I stopped doing any other work and um, concentrated full time on, on storytelling. Was that a, uh, a nerve wracking step or was it just something that you realised you had, you, you had the opportunity <laughs> to do? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, terrifying, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but it all, it was, I think it was one of those things that, uh, you know, we all kind of have our own ways of looking at what we want to do with our life and whether we look for safety and security uh, with, a, you know, with a steady job or what we hope is a steady job or we want to try different things. and. Um, uh, I think I'm I'm towards that end of uh, the uh, uh, the spectrum of thinking when I'm thinking that um, about what I want to be doing. I want to be I want my life on my job to be my lifestyle. So as I started to do more gigs and more successful shows and started to produce my own books, then I realised that yes, people were buying tickets. If I could, if I had the freedom to be able to put on all these extra shows when I was when I was doing uh, doing other work, then then I was uh, I was absolutely sure. 
that it would be a definite success. <laughs> um, and it's getting there. It's getting there. It's not, I'm not going to get rich off storytelling, but that's not what it's about. If the relationship with the audience is at the heart of the storytelling experience, I asked Jason how he went about creating that relationship, how he, as a performer, had learned to engage with listeners. So I think this is something that's enormously important. Um, there's one thing uh, where people can enter a room and you as the performer can, like an actor, appear from the wings and just come on and, and it's very much, very much more theatrical. But it's, when, I, do, when I, I, I teach storytelling in workshops and teach people, and one of the points I have to make is this isn't acting where, the, where you are pretending the audience doesn't exist and the audience are uh, <clears throat> keeping nice and quiet, but as if they're observing through that, the, that removed or that transparent fourth wall. It's a, it's a dialogue, it's a, con, a conversation and an interaction with the audience. So I try to start it from the very beginning. So when I'm doing a show, I like to be either welcoming people in, if, if it's just me on the door checking people's tickets, um, or if someone else is doing that, I like to be there on the stage and, and talking to people as they come in. Nothing flashy, nothing huge, you know, sort of hugely ostentatious, but just talking to people about, you know, well, how far have they come from today and those kind of banal questions. But it means you can start talking to people and you can understand the mood of the people that are coming in. And then they also can understand you and that you're, uh, there's a trust that they, they then put in you as a performer. But I think also there's some very, you know, stock theatrical tricks about call and response. Um, and whenever I start a show, I will always start with it, you know, good evening or good afternoon or whatever. And unless it's really good, the response, <laughs> there's always the thing that everybody expects of the disappointed, oh, come on guys, I know it's cold out there. Should we try again? Good evening. And then you get, good evening from everybody. <laughs> and everybody likes it and it's something easy to do. It's not frightening. You're not asking for volunteers to, to shout good evening on their own. Everybody acts as one. They can behave as a group um, that gives them comfort and gives you a response. And uh, as an old uh, director of mine used to say, you have to get your twinkle out. <laughs> you have to project some empathy to the audience as well. Um, I do it by, I think, probably being slightly buffoonish. That's, my, that's just my, the nature of, I think, my, my character of, uh, of being a bit smiley and waving my arms around too much. Other people may be much more controlled, but however you do that, it's, it's to project that empathy out to the audience. I can hear you, I can see you, and I'm gonna give you this stuff, and I will tell you these things, and we will enjoy this you know, all together. And so it becomes much more of a joined up experience. And once you do that, then the stories you start to tell, people relax, they'll look at those images in their mind, uh, and if you muck up and, or do something funny, or accidentally say something funny, or somebody's mobile phone goes off, then you can deal with all those hiccups uh, like you would with a couple of friends around a table when you're halfway through telling a story about what you did at the weekend. Hmm. I guess one of the advantages of storytelling is in a way it's easier to deal with that kind of thing than if you were an actor and you get derailed in the middle of a performance. Ab absolutely. The, the ability to, uh, to uh, ad-lib, to blag, to stop, to, to, to reverse, to suddenly realise that the thing you're about to tell them, that the hero's about to pull out of his pocket, that's going to be the magic thing, you realise you should have told them half an hour ago at the beginning. And how do I deal with this? It's not just a break. You know, there's lots of ways and tricks around, you know, that you can, you can deal with that in ways that the, the audience doesn't notice and everybody's comfortable. Um, but I have worked with other people uh, doing things who perhaps aren't initially, uh, aren't storytellers uh, by background um, or training. And sometimes I think they find it difficult that I've got to learn all my lines. I've got to be absolutely word perfect. I've got to be this, this, this. Um, and I actually find that often, every telling of a story is different. And there's, there's certain things of certain stories I shouldn't forget because they're essential to the plot. But then sometimes there's other things I shouldn't put things in because it, it, it becomes clumsy and breaks up the narrative but one of those great things you're kind of hinting at there I think is, is that you can you can be free and the story becomes flexible you can bend it around if something funny happens in the audience uh, at a certain point I always for some reason whenever I'm describing and then in the absolute darkness and the absolute stillness and the absolute silence <laughs> someone's phone will go off and of course you know it, the moment it, the, the bubble is burst and everybody laughs but then you can have to deal with this is that you i can hear the angels can you guys hear the angels yeah. and do that and then to step back into the story and if you've got that rapport and that empathy people will enjoy that with you and then step back in into the immersion yes or whatever what i've seen do is storytellers go 
And yes, and then four answered this phone. It was like, this is not a good time. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you get back to me? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You have, to, you have to deal with it sometimes. You just can't ignore it. Hmm. Um, I was talking about in a, in a story about, and he was watching the old man die there in a the bed in front of him. And from a door somewhere else just came... <laughs> Too late. You're too early. You're too early. I'll let I'll let you know when you need to come on. You know, somebody somewhere was was having a coughing fit, but it just fitted perfectly at this very dark, sad moment. Uh, and yet, you have to yeah, just kind of deal with it, make light of it, enjoy it with the audience, and then return to the story. It takes a lot of work and skill to learn how to play to the mood of a room. And we also talked about what can happen when a storyteller gets things wrong with their audience. Yes, I'm always very impressed by storytellers who can uh, do the lewd and the crude very well because it's definitely not a talent of mine. <laughs> I've, I've, I've seen it make people feel very uncomfortable. I was, yes. wa- I was watching somebody yes. uh, do something <laughs> once and they had not pitched it right and it was all about... They were making jokes. It was kind of like, you know, what do women want, but almost doing it the other way around. And he was suggesting what women wanted. And the, the audience was going, oh, really? And they were kind of calling out. And I, and I thought, you need to change what you're doing now. Because mm. uh, he, he, he still carried on driving on forwards. And, yeah. if it, and he, he lost the audience. The audience were very uncomfortable. He got to the end of his set. It was only like a seven-minute set, uh, seven-minute story. But when he went off stage, there was a very nasty kind of taste in everybody's mouth. Because he hadn't he hadn't read the room and he hadn't yeah. kind of got thought this isn't working I now I need to change this if I keep just pushing at it it's not it's not going to be funny it's not going to be interesting people are just getting offended mm. yes no I, I have had that experience as well I've uh, sat in the front row actively trying to avoid eye contact oh, with God. a storyteller who is making me very uncomfortable oh dear. yeah <laughs> yeah but that's back to that rapport thing you were saying earlier. yeah you know, it's, yeah you have to have that empathic. Uh, relationship with your audience you're not just there to to on sort of on broadcast you've got to realize you know when things are going well when they're not going well if they're not going well why aren't they going well I was telling some Viking stories a while back in a place where uh, it was a lovely cocktail bar in London uh, not a kind of fancy uh, fancy long dresses and black tie cocktail bar but quite a nice sort of grungy hip street sort of thing in a in a reconditioned mini cinema in, a, in, in the, the old jail cells of the place um, and a whiskey company had said oh Viking stuff oh well we come from Viking land kind of up in the north so let's bring some free whiskey by the time I'd got sort of halfway through the second half I realised the audience was so pissed that, that they weren't going to hang on for much long, much longer and I actually thought right I could just doggedly keep going through the set that I've got uh, but some of them were getting dozy it was the middle of the week they were getting sleepy others were getting rowdy they were having a great time and so I just had to speed up and Ragnarok happened faster than it should have done uh, but it still happened and it still happened with drama and they all got to enjoy it and they all did it and so actually I, I cut about 15 minutes off the end because I thought I need to finish this up because the audience have had enough mm. I think actually quite a few of them had had enough anyway but uh, uh, yeah because of the free whiskey that had been going around mm. <laughs> yeah. one of the first things that Jason showed me when I arrived was a lovingly handmade book which accompanies him to almost every storytelling performance and to his services, and to the services that he officiates as a celebrant. The books, lovingly inscribed and illustrated, play an important role in Jason's creative process and his performances. You say they were p- partly like a tool for creating your stories. Yeah, so I've got a couple of big, the handmade books that my uh, my late father made, the very sort of big, chunky, uh, artisanal looking, they look like spell books. Um, and they've got lovely thick paper inside. And so they're partly a record of some of my stories. Some of my stories I just have to sit down, I have to get out, or I have to, or they're just in my head, they never leave my head, or at least they haven't yet. Some might go into a you know, Word document and I'll type them on a computer just to kind of, to get them down. Uh, but these ones uh, are written out in full, uh, written out by hand, written with a fountain pen, and then sketched and illustrated as, as you kind of go through. Um, and I often leave those, uh, along with the printed version of my books for sale, but I often leave them outside so people can leaf through them and have a look at them. I used to leave, I used to leave a sign that said, please do touch next to them. <laughs> but everybody read that as please don't touch for some reason, just the human mind. And so it put people off. So I'm always 
constantly encouraging people to handle them and eventually they'll fall apart but that's you know the the beauty of them is to be picked up and handled and they've got you know red wine stains on them and a bit of coffee slopped on them and that for me just adds to that kind of character of that the authenticity um and also uh i also sometimes work as a celebrant as well so doing births and marriages and and, and um sorry namings and marriages and, and funerals uh, and i have uh, at the back of one of my books uh there was the hand fasting ceremony i was doing for a couple which was partly about storytelling as well um, they wrote some of the they wrote some of the ceremony and then I collected some stories and put those there so the stories were part of the ceremony um, and I literally printed off their their words their ceremony and with pins I physically pinned them into one of the big back one of the back of the big books so then I had in my hand this wonderful prop you know that, that is you know I'm not, I'm, I, it's not a I haven't got a bible but I had this great big sort of lovely sort of friendly spell book friendly grimoire thing in my hands I can then read from and uh, they actually came to a show of mine recently and they were looking through one of my books just at my, at my drawings and at the end and they suddenly said oh, Jason Jason you've got our, you've got our wedding in the back of your book still yeah absolutely <laughs> it's, now, it's now part of that book yeah so that, that's now become a sort of a, a nice artifact beyond its, its original purpose but yes they're nice they're, they're nice tools for helping me develop stories um, and especially when I spend a bit of time illustr- I like to illustrate the, the stuff sometimes I've got many more illustrations than I have written stories but that's perhaps part of that creative process it helps, it helps me think about the story while I'm drawing and sometimes the drawing will suggest things that, that I can then add to the story but yeah well, I'd say yeah the difference in right so when I put printed books together they tend to be with stories that I've already told but then there's a lot of different work that goes into that so there's a Viking show that I've told before which is two hours including an interval. So how long should it take me to write down two hours? You think, well, let's say four hours maybe. Um, it was, I think it was February last year, a year on, I haven't finished it. Um, <laughs> so there's that disconnect between that physical writing and creating the stories, because some of the stories are, are just bullet points on paper for me, because I know in my head, I can see the scenes and how they blend and what happens, but I don't need to write it down. I might need to just to capture the bullet points so that when I'm really thinking about a new story, um, I know I haven't missed out anything important and then once those provide the kind of the bones the framework then I can kind of uh, put the flesh on those bones separately and again every time I tell a story it often changes the ones I'm doing now there's the endings of both of them have changed each time slightly I haven't quite got to a fixed ending mm. depending on how I've told it as it goes through and depending on how the evening feels it could end, end very dramatically or it kind of the same stuff happens but just just the certain ways it does um, so it's not fixed mm. I think another great feeling that I get from that whole thing as well is that you're never done with the story no absolutely you know, and you never look back at a story and say oh well that could have been better it's like oh yeah. well I'll tell it again <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah. and this time <laughs> yeah there's some stuff that I've got which is written down and when I go back and read it now and I think oh god that feels so so clunky and so so wrong and I realised that I had written it down and that was the, like a first draft or a first go and as soon as it was live as soon as it was, it was out as soon as I was telling it the words I had written weren't right they didn't flow or there was a better idea and something came to me in the moment or I realised that this wasn't kind of working it didn't feel right so I had to change direction to do something and then of course the next time I did I tweaked a bit more and tweaked a bit more and tweaked a bit more Another source of inspiration for Jason is the world of fantasy fiction and role-playing games. I asked him whether this had influenced his journey into storytelling. Oh, that's great. You've, uh, you've alluded to a few times, um, sort of, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, role-playing games. And things. Yes. And uh, was it LARPing? Yes, LARPing, yeah, 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 absolutely, so yeah. I'm sure that there are members of our audience uh, who... I hope there are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who've done that kind of thing. So... How did that, uh, is there a link between that and your storytelling? Or? Absolutely, I'd say that's where my storytelling started. I started playing Dungeons and Dragons when I was 13. Um, and when you're 13 and you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, it's mostly about rolling dice and collecting gold pieces and, and getting it right. And then as you sort of mature a bit as a person and, and mature into it, it becomes much more about the story experience. And so myself and my friends were less kind of consumed by having hugely strong characters with all the powers and all the things but it was much more about the experience and the drama and the story and being involved and immersed in it um i don't think we realized at the time that's just the way we did it as opposed to a lot of other sort of uh, dice rolling so people who prefer the dice rolling and, and and points based um 
But that was where I, as a, the games master, where I had to create the scenario, had to deliver it and draw people along into it. It basically became interactive storytelling. So yes, some of it was dice rolling and fighting goblins and whatever, but a lot of it was actually about what happened to those characters and how do those characters interplay with the, the, the characters I created that I sort of set up for them and, and, those, and those situations. Um, and I would create uh, scenarios which basically now would be the beginning of a story and what I just did those days was I made it into a role playing game because that was the that was the platform that I had and then I'd invite my, my mates around we'd have a curry and you know hundreds of tins of very cheap lager and um, we'd sit down and we'd play through these games we'd roll some dice and they'd all be part of this yeah this shared story experience I never really got into role playing games, but I wanted to, and I think mm. it was almost because of a similar thing. I tried to play it with my friends; they yeah. weren't interested in the story. No, they spent a huge amount of time fighting each other rather than the actual yeah. opponents. That's right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I just yeah. never got into it. Through, I read, had all the books. I read them all, and for me, actually, it was sci-fi at that yes. stage rather than you know yeah, they were yeah. all Star Wars. But it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very much, it's a huge um, inspiration, the kind of whole mm. idea of creating these worlds and giving you the materials to be a storyteller, I guess. Absolutely, um, yeah. And especially if you do write a lot of those those scenarios, the, the, the stories for the games, then you do start to create a bigger and bigger world in your head. The sort of things that, you know, if you watch all the Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings and Hobbit films, uh, then you've got, you know, you've actually got quite a lot of Middle Earth in your head. Um, but when you're creating those worlds, there's all sorts of details that nobody ever finds out or hears about because it's never re relevant, never relevant to surface. Um, but the worlds become huge and immense and complex, and then you revisit parts and those stories. But and, and something that someone noticed in a game three months ago suddenly resurfaces and becomes relevant or interesting, or something gets shelved because they can't do it or they miss it, and then you can you can return to that again. So, yeah, it's a, it's it's a it's a, it's a mentally immersive uh, experience. I asked Jason whether there were differences between working with material from real world mythology and the fantasy worlds of literature, film and gaming culture. Um, and what do you mean by real mythology? Something that's a bit more kind of tangible day to, today? Um, well, it's actually historical, you know. Uh, Norse mythology okay. existed, Tolkien's yes. Middle Earth doesn't. R oh, sure I see. There's a okay. question there or not. But... <laughs> okay, well, yeah, yes. Because, well, I suppose sometimes there is a thing of... Um, there was a story that I wrote very early on, which is called The Loom, and it is about it's a it's a it's a sort of a bit of a riff on Hansel and Gretel, um, uh, and there's a big bad witch in there. They go to the cottage. It's not made of gingerbread, but there is a cottage in the woods. The witch catches them. You know the 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 son. It's actually um, uh, Petra and Piotr. It's more of a kind of Eastern European version. But the witch puts the son, the boy, in the in the cage and fattens him up to eat him. They escape. Blah blah blah. But it ends differently. And somebody afterwards was saying to me, mm, "Is that is that Baba Yaga, the uh, 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 the witch?" And I said, "Well, you know, she could be. She could be." Said, yes. Well, I actually think you'll find that actually Baba Yaga. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and I was kind of schooled on what Baba Yaga was supposed to be in the in, you know, in the kind of canon of of uh, uh, of Eastern European and, and Russian mythology. And I just and I thought that's well, not really necessary. I don't, you know, even if I say it's Baba Yaga, it, it's my Baba Yaga, you know. Mm. If you could get the re if the real Baba Yaga could now step forward <laughs> from the line, and I'm you know I'm sh showing something that's wrong, but it's you know my reality is the reality. And I say when I again when I say say to storytellers who are doing workshops, you know your word is law. As the storyteller, you are a god. Whatever you create is real. Mm. And if people ever disagree with your stories, then you can come back to well that was the way it was told to me. <laughs> that's you know that's how it appeared to me because it doesn't matter about factual correctness in in mythology. Mm. I don't think. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? There's all kinds of there. I mean, everybody has their different takes. Um, there's a sense in which, see, so working in mythology, I've, uh, you know, I contrast it to a lot of things uh, like you know fantasy worlds, yeah. like Star Wars, yeah. Tolkien, yeah. where there are a huge number of people who are obsessed with uh, canon and what yes. what what what. Is there is in is uh, what's officially sanctioned or that yes. kind of thing? Oh, I see. That's a bit fan fiction. It's not actually canon. I think you'll find. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas in uh, mythology, there are so many different versions of everything. Yeah. You know, you can find all these different yeah. versions, um, and I think that you know people, uh, some people who are obsessed with canon, could do with embracing that mindset yeah. a bit more. But then you do find um, uh, 
uh, people who who are like you say that way with folklore and you know apparently it's uh, some traditional cultures as well are a bit like that there is apparently at one point a, a storytelling council in Ireland which used to summon oh, all right. the storytellers oh, together right. okay. yeah. um, and if people had two different versions of the same story they made a decision about whose was the right one yeah. <laughs> and I thought hmm, I love the, the bit of information about storytelling from the past uh, yeah. I don't think I would have enjoyed that as a creative no. <laughs> yeah. I, suppose, um, I suppose it's a thing there where you kind of start straying into things about what is, what is mythology and what is history in the same way, the um, basically the, the, when the Romans sat down with all the books of the Bible and said, "What, what do we want to keep? And what don't we want to keep?" And what the current, you know, the, 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 what we have as the modern Bible is, a, is, a, is an edited down version that that some some Romans, uh, some blokes, basically said, "Yeah, we reckon this is the true stuff." We've edited out the bits we think probably wasn't true, but you know, even though of course everything is is infallible, um, <laughs> and. Um, so you end up with a truth about this and then that suddenly becomes absolutely immutable truth mm. but because those effectively those are all stories you know lots of the things to do with lots of the holy books are essentially iron age iron age myths that have been put into collections and then preserved and now have become have become canon and have become law in you know, in some countries and i can imagine that some of the stuff in you know in the, in the council in ireland would be people would be talking referring to old kings or places or things that you know and then what's the real one so who actually was that king how do you say his name what did he do did he have three wives or is it one wife and two sons and other what is you know what's the truth there whereas today when we talk about storytelling we don't talk about any of the religious stuff as being stories we talk about it as as gospels or about you know holy books or chapters or however you kind of cut those up um whereas the rest of this is, is kind of you know sort of made up fantasy we want well with all of those questions answered four cracked his great hammer and ice from the brows of the giant came raining down on our heads and we could barely hear each other speak so I'm just glad that we managed to pack all of that in anyway. You've been listening to a guest episode of Lore and Legend with storyteller Jason Book. Once again, if you'd like to find out more about Jason's work or attend one of his future gigs or online storytelling sessions, you can find him on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash Jason Book Storyteller or at www jasonbookstoryteller.co.uk The lore and legend theme music in this episode was performed by Robert Bentall. To find out more about episodes of Lore and Legend, you can visit www.loreandlegend.co.uk and check out our episode blog posts. If you like what you hear and you want to hear more, please consider joining Christy and Paul in supporting the podcast and becoming a patron. Go to our website and click support us for more details. That's it for now. Look out next month for more from us. We'll continue to bring you more interviews with storytellers and you can look forward to a series of mini episodes teasing the second season of Lore and Legend, which is called The Gates of Dream. Look out for The Dreaming Pit, The Warlord's Dream, The Binding of Cassandra, and the dream of the sculptor in the coming months and weeks. Thanks again for listening, and stay safe out there, story folk. <laughs>